Hello and welcome to the final nine steps to future proofing your warehouse. Um, thank you to everyone for joining again uh, and thank you to all those that have joined throughout the, uh, the whole webinar. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a great journey. Um, obviously you can watch these back on YouTube and I think it's been um, uh, really great and thank you to everyone who's been involved, uh, both speakers and attendees. Um, also a big thanks to, uh, to Jeff and Baz who have been um, huge contributors to this whole process. Um, we're looking to potentially continue this on uh, beyond this so please look out for further information about that uh, this week we have a slight change uh, from the normal process we um we're going to be wrapping up the 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 whole webinar with a, a really nice touch into other areas of the warehouse to be aware of uh, and to and some great thinking points as well so uh i will pass over to baz uh, sorry over to jeff who, who will do the instructions for today uh, and will also host uh, today's session so over to you jeff Thank you, Dan, and welcome everyone to our final session. Uh, what a journey it's been. It's, uh, it's great, as, as uh, Dan said, today we're gonna be doing a slightly different format. It's great to finally be able to just let our hair down and wrap up the series with a good chat. Um, I also wanna thank Daniel and the team at uh, CMAT for allowing us to, um, or kind of, you know, partnering with us to, to get through this series and, and share a lot of knowledge with our clients. It's something uh, with, with the market, I mean, it's something we've been wanting to do for a long time and hopefully we will continue to do it. I uh, also want to thank all of the previous guests and, and our vendors and, and all of the brains that we've had on. I think it's been a, a, a really good learning series for, for us. Um, and yeah, also to the, the, the loyal listeners and people that are diving in over the last, um, nine nine sessions it's been quite a journey and it's it's also been kind of with the background of COVID in the background uh so hopefully it's it's been a little bit of a, a beacon of hope for people along the way uh the idea for today is to have a holistic discussion about some of the soft topics around designing your future warehouse we've been quite technical in the past focused functionally on the warehouse but today we're going to be looking at things like recruitment cyber security contracts and safety uh, which are all just as important uh, to getting your DC right and making sure that it's a future-proof DC. I'm sure a lot of questions will come up, come up during our discussions and I can actually see some, some notes and things popping up in, in the background. I'm going to have to hide that so I don't get distracted. Uh, but don't, yeah, don't forget, it is interactive. Uh, we, we'd love to hear from you and any questions that you, you may still have uh, hanging over. So without any further ado, uh, I'll jump into introducing today's panellists. So our, our first panelist, and I've gone in alphabetical order just to have some kind of order, because you always have to have a reason for doing things. So we'll start off with Alex uh, Tesoriero. Hopefully I said that right, Alex. Uh, Alex is a national sales manager for Summit Recruitment. He's worked in the recruitment industry for the past 12 years, specifically working within warehouse and distribution organizations across the ANZ region in recruitment of talent uh, from operations all the way to C-suite. So good knowledge base there. Um, Baz, Baz Shielders, our principal consultant in Fuzzy Logics. He's going to be kind of flying the safety and, and warehouse automation flag today. Uh, we all know Baz, so hello Baz, welcome. Uh, David Varadsky, uh, Dave's the Director of Cyber Risk Australia, a boutique cyber security consultancy specialising in cyber threat and third party assessments for ASX mid cap organisations. He's previously held uh, senior level management and consulting positions across some really high profile uh, companies in Australia. And if you ever really want to get uh, a good idea about how to manage your cyber risks, you, you'll see today that David's a fountain of knowledge. And last but certainly not least is uh, Michael Mills. Mike is the principal lawyer and founder of Supplied Legal. Uh, at Supplied Legal, they help their clients with projects uh, and legal issue, issues, specifically in the logistics and supply chain sector, which is quite unique. It's a good niche and he's really good at it. He's previously worked at leading law firms in Australia and the UK and uh, as an in-house counsel uh, for a large FMCG supplier. Mike is also a committee member of the Australian Supply Chain Institute. So as you can see, we've got a really knowledgeable panel. So let's jump straight into seeing how much we can learn from their combined experience today. So we, we've, we've tried to split it up a little bit into uh, the four different topics but we are going to go around the table and get everyone's view on it. So we're going to start off with cybersecurity. And this is obviously David's um, field of, of knowledge and, and expertise. So we might just start with a very simple question. David, in this day and age, how do you define cybersecurity? Uh, thanks, Jeff, for inviting me to, to join the panel. Um, 
I guess the definition is changing over time, but cybersecurity is, you know, it's, right, it's having the right sort of governance, the right people, the right processes, the right technology to protect yourself against attack or damage or unauthorized access. And that, that um, is a moving feast. You know, in 2005, it was probably called IT security. And that was a techie thing. And you, you remember the images of the guys in the back rooms with hoodies. And in, in 2000, by 2010, it sort of evolved to be called information security. And people were concerned more about data, uh, credit card data, personal data, a, as well as the tech. And the threat was more um, from uh, traditional organized crime outfits who tried to get hold of your data and your, and your cards. Uh, 2015 is when we started to hear the words cybersecurity, and uh, that's probably because the threat had now evolved into cloud, into the uh, into cyberspace, um, into cloud and third parties. And uh, today it's evolving even further. You see um, in the paper every day about um, state actors um, involved, um, cyber, more cyber savvy organised crime out outfits, and even your competitors. So um, starting to even be, be called cyber resilience now. Uh, and that may be a term it may evolve to, you'll probably see that um, over the next uh, year or so, it may evolve to cyber resilience, where it's all about a pervasive threat, uh, infrastructure, people, systems, devices, as we move to 5G and the internet of things. And uh, really it's a business problem. It's, it's to be resilient against all those sorts of risks, be they governance, people, process or technology. Oh, that's, that's a great, uh, uh, yeah, I personally learned a bit there myself. So I'm sure everyone else would have found that quite um, uh, interesting and, and insightful as well. So you, you, you spoke about some of those, those key threats. You know, what are the key risks that businesses are facing? I'm imagining I'm working from home right now. Uh, pretty much everyone on the call is. I'm not sure Alex looks like he's in an office. But most of us are working from home these days. Does that bring additional risks? And then how does kind of the warehouse fit into that? Yeah, so um, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm sort of on, uh, you know, probably 26 weeks of work from home, and probably won't be uh, going near the city till uh, till the new year, perhaps. Um, uh, sort of in, the, in their own offices, um, but I think um, people are understandably concerned about um, their health and safety, and uh, organised crime, and possibly um, possibly supported by state actors, are, are taking advantage of this. Um, and you, you were seeing. Um, an increased level of phishing emails with, um, with COVID news. So the, the lures are COVID related. You see news um, items or COVID warnings or about areas that may be, have infection or potential cures. And the people are more, much, much more likely to click on those sorts of things because they're worried about that sort of stuff. And uh, you know, you're also seeing um, you know, compromised COVID maps. So you see the maps of the world, you know, some of those are even got vulnerabilities in them that can spread malware. Uh, again, you're seeing um, ransomware attacks on healthcare. So uh, right through the world, um, healthcare providers getting ransomware attacks, and a lot of uh, starting to see IP theft um, in medical research as companies are striving to get a vaccine, they're getting hit by IP theft. Um, so, or the other issue is um, with with everybody working from home, many of your controls that you are normally see operating in an office environment are degraded. You don't have the firewall around you. You don't have your email filtering. You don't have your intrusion detection. Um, the ability to see the compromise will really depend on whether people are actually connected to the VPN all the time. And often they're not. They're connected directly to a cloud service uh, from their home location. Uh, we're also finding you know, AV updates um, and patching of systems may not be happening um, as often um, as you'd expect, because people aren't, their machines aren't on the, on the local area network anymore. And uh, those, that patching and um, I, updates may not be happening through the VPN. You may need to install mm. additional um, infrastructure and um, re, uh, push out um, code to your machines to be able to uh, pick up uh, updates through the internet rather than through the office environment. Um, your workers are also working at home. They've got home networks and home work networks by, by design and uh, you know, by, by cost uh, are typically going to have a lot more vulnerabilities in an office environment. So the home networks that people are using, their firewall, they, you know, they wouldn't have firewalls, I do, but uh, most people wouldn't. Um, and they, they're using their own home machines, um, their own home BYOD and home devices. Um, they also may be using their work machine for more dangerous pursuits. The kids might be using it because it's the only mach another, another machine to play games on. 
Um, so you may be having that sort of thing in, um, happening. So the way it affects the, 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 the warehouse is, uh, yeah, you've got to look at, um, you, you've even got um, more degrading of your perimeter and, and you've got to think wider and, and you know, now you're, you've got to think about um, you know, where is your perimeter, it's probably nowhere, it's probably in somebody's house. <laughs> now, well, once again, a very well-rounded um, kind of understanding of, of what that landscape looks like. And from my point of view, you know, we get involved in designing the new distribution centers of the, of the future. And a lot of the time we, we lean towards people like yourself because we expect that they're going to design the right system for us. And I think this is where we can segue a little bit into the legal side. Michael, uh, from your experience, uh, how can a business protect themselves against some of these risks? Is there something you can do in your contract to make sure that, you know, the impetus is there for your 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 contractor to, to protect you properly. And if it doesn't happen, like some of the high profile cases that have happened recently, what, how, how, do you, how do you kind of recover from that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and thank you again for the invitation to be here, Jeffrey. Um, so, I mean, getting into it, when you think about, uh, and as Dave was saying there, the, you know, the attackers are gonna be looking for the, the weakest link in the network. And um, when you think about all the organizations in the supply chain that work together, um, and how they interact, you know, it's the links in relationships through contracts. So the, the contract is a place where you're going to put those obligations. And um, if you have things that you want them to, your, your suppliers to do, then that's going to be the place you put it. So there's, um, there's that side of it. So there's the contract side. So there's thinking you as an organization, what are you contracting to do? So what are you agreeing if, um, <clears throat> if, customers or suppliers are asking you to take on particular obligations. And then thinking about well, what do you want them to do as well? So um, in terms of complying with any investigations into breaches, uh, whether it's complying with your um, IT data security policies, um, what are the steps that you want them to do so that you can get that confidence that the whole network is robust before your, your information starts flowing through it. So oh, yeah, that's a great point. Issues, yeah. So the last thing you think about, what's my data security breach policy when I'm trying to implement an automated future-proof warehouse? Yeah, <laughs> Very important. Right. Yes, it. And then there's also just being really aware of what types of data a, there is and coming through and what different compliance regimes are. So, you know, a lot of um, warehouse data or, um, you know, movement of goods, that kind of thing, um, it, it's not necessarily personal information. So there's the data security, um, being able to access your data, but then as soon as you get into kind of personal information, so that's employee information or customer information, if that's flowing through the systems as well and they get compromised, then you get into kind of other compliance requirements around notifying people who've been affected um, and notifying the regulator as well. So you've sort of got those uh, compliance side to think about as well. And to be able to do that, you might need your customers and suppliers to pass on certain information and, cooperate with that investigation and get involved. So you want to put that into your contracts too, to make sure that you've got those, those powers. I don't know about everyone so, else, but I'm, I'm overwhelmed already. And <laughs> I guess it's, I'm glad that there's, there's professionals like you and David that do focus on this stuff. And I guess Baz, I might just drag you in here. You know, we're, we're seeing from our side of things, you know, we're looking at these systems coming out and we're seeing a growth in virtualization. It means your warehouse is now, David mentioned the internet of things. Everything's supposed to be connected and talking to each other so we can learn from it. You know, from your experience, I know you, you've been close to some of these high profile cases. You've also come across a lot of contracts and automation solutions in the past. Um, what are the strategies that you can think of that may, may enable, uh, you know, people looking to, to go into higher levels of technology and automation to avoid some of these headaches? Look, I think Jeff, it's a, it's a very interesting topic because and in, in very close to my heart, as you say. So some of our customers, unfortunately, are part of that list of, um, of the list that people know of, of cyber threats in the last um, couple of months. Um, it's a hard one. So look, in the past, it was a very simple one. There was only a couple of entrances you'd have into a warehouse from a data point of view, which is either through a VPN connection to dial in internet. Um, or someone would have a back door somewhere built into a control cabinet that was sitting somewhere on the floor uh, with a modem built into it that was used just, just in case. You're just the last final backup in case we couldn't get to, um, to the server or to the network uh, in case of a breakdown. Of course, those things have changed nowadays, and it's, it's a lot less obvious, and there's a lot more layering in between nowadays. 
So it becomes actually a lot harder to control. So whereas in the past it was simply you know, the server that was controlling the OS, the server would control the, the automation, and, and that was that. Now you look at what you said before, you know, the Internet of Things, all of these sensors, all these drives, every single component that is part of that automated solution is connected somehow into something. And it's the into something that is, is most of the time is very blurred. It's not like you have a fully documented description of, you know, this sensor talks to this sensor via this protocol and it only has access to, to this and this information. It's just you get a, a high level global overview of your, your warehouse environment from an IT point of view. Um, and you just hope for the best almost that your supplier actually controls the inputs and outputs into those systems and make sure they're safe. And I think what we're finding now with some of those high profile names is that, especially for older type systems, um, there is big security gaps in those systems which just haven't been patched yet. And it's just, it takes, just takes someone with a bit of time and a bit of knowledge um, to then start digging, uh, find a, a back door somewhere because they still exist in a lot of systems and start hacking away. I mean, what is it? Um, I think I put it on iCloud, one of my favorite uh, whiskey distiller, distiller, or distributors in the U.S. or distilleries. Someone was in the network for a month before they found out, a month without anyone knowing. And that's not a standalone case. That's just the ones we know about. So my thing now, I think what we see now a lot more is people like David, people like Michael, even people like Alex getting involved in these types of projects at an earlier stage before these things happen to make sure that whatever we put in place from an automation point, point of view um, is actually secure enough to continue operating in the next 10, 15 years, as long as it's supposed to be there. And if something does go wrong, that you're covered from a, a legal perspective um, to make sure that you can at least recover some of your costs or some of your, your, your um, uh, reputation. Yeah, no, I think all, all really valid topics. And for me, you know, I'm always trying to think about the connections, right? We talk about everything's connected now. So that point of connection for me is the failure point, right? When I'm an engineering brain, always looking for failure points. And, and those connections are the failure point. But there's also a, a not so direct connection, which is labor, which historically has been a great way to enter systems from the inside. You can go hard out, you know, with your firewalls and the rest of it. But, um, you know, we've heard the, about the Stuxnet virus that, that crippled Iran's nuclear program. I've heard anecdotes about USBs being dropped in car parks and that, that's how they make their way into SCADA systems. And Alex, from, from a people point of view, you know, that's what you're focused on. The, pretty much the most important labor, uh, important resource in a warehouse is people. What, what, what are your clients coming to you about, about security? Are you having these conversations? Are, are they becoming more conscious about how do I train my operators to, to be aware? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really interesting sitting here and, and listening to David talking about people and process and, and Michael mentioning a lot about cybersecurity and personal information because um, yeah, there are countless stories about uh, even talent software. So within the background of everything that we do from our end, um, we're connected into uh, all your major job boards and social sites to gather inf information about people who are applying for jobs. Those people, uh, their information is being shared as they're making applications for jobs. And it, it, it's just been fascinating to listen to because particularly through COVID, one of the things that businesses were not prepared for was people working from home. They had to go onto uh, personal computers and, and that has just opened the doors right up. And I think this is a really important learning curve for us as to how little emphasis is being placed in the workforce around cybersecurity. Um, these, you know, these phishing attacks, for example, where people are clicking into, in, into pages to find out information. Um, this is, this is because they aren't aware of what potentially may occur when they're doing that. Um, and we're, we're seeing a lot of organizations where uh, high level emails are sent out th uh, by a fraudulent artist who may, uh, may, may have an, a, a title of a, a HR director or, or something along those lines where people aren't even acknowledging that the email address isn't correct. They're just clicking straight into it. Um, and, and I think that, Unfortunately, it's going to be an ever-evolving cycle. Uh, as David mentioned earlier, we always used to think of um, 
the bad guys as, as mobsters and <laughs> people trying to collect our, our uh, banking information. It, it is no longer that way. And until we educate people around what potentially may occur as a result of us uh, inadvertently opening an email or, or doing something online, we are, we are in the information age. Um, so I am seeing a lot of organizations placing a lot more emphasis on onboarding and taking on uh, a, a lot more screening techniques, um, you know, going through background checks of employees before they come into the organization. And that's all good and well, but unless we continue to train people throughout the time, uh, because workforces are fluid, they're forever changing. You know, some workforces are full of people that have been there for 30 years that have done things the same way for 20 of those years. <laughs> um, and then other times we're hiring people in, in, in mass amounts, like right now where, where a lot of organizations are, are growing rapidly and need to put on mass amounts of people. And if we don't get that onboarding process correctly, we bring them into the organization, we open up the risks. It's, it's not all about hard tech and what is hardwired. It is also about, you know, how much we're opening the floodgates up and allowing people to come into the organization at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. And they can be the hardest part to control. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, we've just had a question come through and it might be a, uh, um, uh, yeah, we just had a, a response. Training and educating people in this area is important to ensure data is protected and people know what to look for and not click suspicious emails. And I think all of us have had to go on a journey on that. Uh, but a question for you, David, maybe just to wrap up the cybersecurity piece before we move into contracts and law. Um, the question is, I am curious to know what kind of protection systems are put into place to protect the data and information being transmitted and shared with various different partners in the supply chain. So I think you mentioned firewalls. What else is there? Um, I think uh, due diligence is important. So uh, it's really important, um, I guess, in the warehouse context, the there's a number of interfaces. The first interface you need to think about, obviously, is that human interface, unauthorized access from those third parties, as I think you mentioned um, earlier in, in those back doors and so forth, um, and, and potentially rogue employees for background checks and, um, and so forth. But you need to do your due diligence on those organisations you're dealing with and um, uh, properly configure their support access, um, train your people to be aware of the social engineering methods and indicators of compromise on, on devices, and um, uh, make sure that um, you take your uh, technical um, uh, infrastructure is hardened. And we've also talked about that, you know, that, that, uh, making sure uh, you've um, hardened vulnerabilities in your networks, in your servers, systems and devices that they're accessing. Um, so yeah. if they're going to come in through a VPN, you make sure that that's got, you know, proper uh, encryption on it. They come through a, um, that service through your, um, wide through your network so you make sure that the routing is correct with with um, restrictions on IP addresses and so forth um, they'll hit a, um, a jump box or some sort of um, uh, remote um, remote device which needs to be um, hardened and, and secured that they, they're the only people who can access that and they can only go to one place you want to put in the right sort of um, logging and monitoring is an important control to understand um, you know, where, where they've been and what they've been doing. Um, you may also want to consider, depending on the size of your organisation, having time of day restrictions. So having some sort of restrictions on that access to whatever the minimum amount of support um, time you need. It won't be 24 hours a day. It may be, you know, certain times of the day, certain days of the week. You don't want your support organisation, supporters, support company dialing in at midnight, if that's not what they're supposed to be doing, maybe they are, but you know. yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you really have to when you when you mentioned at the beginning there your due diligence. It sounds like it's it's really about getting someone who knows what they're talking about to do their due diligence because, yeah, it, it's it's end to end, isn't it? Thanks yes. for that, David. Um, we'll we'll move into contracts and law. We, I think cyber security is a topic we could speak about the whole session, but we'll, we'll we will try to uh, weave it back into some of the other topics. Uh, Michael. So just to, to give us a, a kind of high level overview, what, what are the major uh, legal issues that you're helping your clients with specifically in logistics and the supply chain sector? Yeah, um, well, I mean, there's so many. So, I mean, there's, um, you know, supply chains, complex systems, complex networks, there's lots of moving parts. So, you know, 
as we just talked about then you've got the most important thing in the way has people so when people are employed so you get into kind of areas of employment law and that's a whole specialist area there um you know safety so work health and safety there's general health and safety requirements that all businesses have but then very specialist within supply chains so whether it's in the warehouse environment itself so particularly uses machinery equipment and that kind of thing um or whether it's the kind of chain of responsibility type stuff um so you know, trucks moving rest times or all sort of specialist type issues um there's the whole regulatory piece and there's a lot that goes off in lots of different directions we talked about privacy breaches data breaches just before privacy law um complying with personal information privacy law you know there's complying with um trade practices law so make sure you're doing things that aren't anti-competitive and you're not talking to competitors about things and um not forcing people to use particular suppliers or small suppliers out of business and that kind of thing um and that's kind of a big part of where i spend all of my time um oh. and kind of i guess um emerging regulations and legislation so you know the modern slavery act came in so that's a big one for supply chain um and then industry specific issues as well so if you're in a particular industry if you're moving certain things whether it's um you know food sector whether it's uh, dangerous goods you know specific requirements to to, to follow and, track. and then there's the you know i mean everyone sort of gets familiar with the rules and you start to base your operations around it and everything else and then suddenly COVID happens and regulations and laws are being changed overnight and they're being announced <laughs> that they can write them and it's state you know it's the state procedures and things are happening on the ground they're different so you know, it's a whole moving piece there as well so yeah it's a it's a busy area of work yeah, I, I know for me, I'm, I'm currently working on a couple of projects in New Zealand and I've had to start getting familiar with some of their um, co tendering contracts. Right. And it's just, yeah, uh, it's, it's very, not, very much not, not my cup of tea. As I say, <laughs> I, I very much want to focus on the functional side of things always. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But yeah. I know Baz, Baz is definitely the one with the, the strong suit in that area. Um, and, and just to kind of bring it back to the warehouse, bring it back specifically to the automation, you know, we've just been through an eight-session eight, eight, eight session journey and we're, we're building that future-proof warehouse. So, so Baz, what are those key contracts? You know, I, I, lo I love that you mentioned employment because that's, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, obviously, in the, in the next section. But, um, you know, we, we, we've already touched on cybersecurity, so your systems. Baz, what are the contracts that we're looking at here when we're looking at automated systems um, within, let's talk intra-logistics a little bit or maybe even inside the... The, the fence line, what, what, what are the key ones that you've come across in some of those um, things that we can learn? I mean, the good thing is for, for what we do, and so probably the good thing about living in this country in the first place is, you know, it's a good and bad thing. We've got all of these Australian standards that we need to comply with. Um, and fortunately enough for us, there is a standard contract type that is specifically designed for, um, I'll call it automated solutions. It's called an AS4910. Uh, in its various forms and formats. Um, that's probably the main one that we usually find with most of the systems that we do, especially automated ones. And it actually has, it stipulates certain things like, you know, practical completion, um, certain things around uh, what certain stages of the project actually mean. So even if you're not really familiar with the way a project works, it'll actually give you a guideline of what to look out for. Now, that's probably the bigger one. But if, if you can imagine, a warehouse itself or a distribution center, everything within those four walls or within the fence line will have a contract, whether it's support, whether it is uh, labor, whether it is your cleaners, whether it is uh, making sure the building is secure, uh, an IT contract, uh, outsourcing, everything is contractual. And, and you know, as you know, I'm married to a lawyer, uh, just like yourself, Jeff. So uh, that has its, its, its pros and cons, so to speak. Uh, but what it does, or what it has, has taught me and, and you as well, is that you, know, you don't, don't necessarily need a contract until something goes horribly wrong. That's the main thing. It's, it's basically it's your safety net uh, after the fact almost um, yeah. to make sure that whatever you, do, you agreed upon, if it doesn't get delivered or if something fails or something goes horribly wrong, that's your fallback scenario. So it's it, part of yeah. like a guideline. This is, this is what we're looking at. And this is what we have to follow, but we all agree that this is the way to do it as well. At the end of it, it looks like if something goes wrong, and Michael will notice from, from experience especially, and we've been in a few of those situations as well, 
is that's the hard fact of your agreement with someone else as to what they have to deliver in what format, in what time frame, to what quality level, uh, and in our case, to what performance levels especially. Um, yeah, it, it's your only fallback scenario. But to today's point, you know, if you get I call it hacked, I'm, I'm a simple soul, David, sorry. If you get hacked, um, a contract's not going to save you, but a contract is at least going to define, you know, what um, what monetary uh, measures are in place to to facilitate some form of recuperation of, of your loss of, of revenue, for instance, is going to, uh, in the case of a, an automation solution, determine uh, liquidated damages, for instance, when something is is, is late. That's our fallback. Mm. And it does really feel again where it's it's very much a case of. You have to do your end-to-end due diligence, don't you? I remember at times, you know, where you've come at and you, you've told me that you've been involved in some of these discussions and uh, the discussion around lettable area, you know, that can get missed in a in a in a um, a property contract. There, so and and same as you know what we very regularly do, which is you know monitoring the the productivity of automated systems and then trying to get. Uh, the, the integrators to, to achieve those. And it comes back to what you said. It's your safety net that you sign off, but you never realize until you pull out the safety net how many holes there are in it that don't actually give you that, you know, that safety that you were looking for. Now, David, I'm going to throw back to you. I think Baz touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to just throw it back to you because I, I did the same thing for, for Michael in, in your topic. Um, with, with cyber risk, uh, what's your experience in terms of actually trying to get protection up front through contracts? Yeah. Any, any tips of the trade there? Yeah, I think it's important to not accept the standard terms and conditions. So often, you know, you're dealing with a big uh, American corporation or something, or overseas corporation, they've got standard T's and C's. It's important not to, uh, not to just accept it and uh, try to become informed, as, as I said, through that security assessment you, and due diligence you conduct up front. Once you've been informed of what the gaps are in their solution, make sure you have the right contract language. So make sure you have a really good definition of what a breach is and uh, make sure that you're also allowing for a breach and a potential breach in your contract. Uh, and um, making sure that that contract language addresses all the deficiencies that were picked up in the assessment or you rectify them before you, uh, before you sign off on the deal. Um, you need to put in, um, a right for audit clauses um, or a requirement to provide you with an independent audit report um, on their um, systems on an annual basis, something like a SOC 2 Type 2 report or a security certification like ISO 27001. You may also, uh, and one of the experiences I had is um, it's not often um, clear who you're actually contracting with. You're contracting, you, you sign up and, and uh, have negotiations with someone and then realize, oh, they're not the, really the party who's actually operating most of the infrastructure. So often you'll need to uh, make sure that everybody who's providing a service is, is on the hook on the contract. So that may involve the primary contractor, the subcontractors, and I've even seen cases where a main shareholder has to give a personal guarantee because there's not enough money in, the, in those companies to, to allow for a breach. Um, uh, because it's, it's VC funded or the people that are offshore or, or so forth. Yeah. No, that, 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 yeah, really good points again. Um, they, you just, you really can't be complacent in this at all, can you? Um, and Alex, just, you know, I'm, I'm sure again, labor hire, we've, we've, we've spoken about, um, I think Michael touched on it as well in terms of the, the, that's, that's a key part of contracts. And uh, a lot of the time when we're building automation business cases, we're, we're looking at, at, to offset it against a reduction in labor or a more flexible labor arrangement. Uh, are we seeing changes in these, in these contracts, Alex, um, based on these, these changing circumstances in the industry? Uh, Two-fold question. Um, you know, if you look at labor hire, labor hire contracts, I think that, um, as Baz mentioned, everyone's looking for safeguards and, li and liabilities. Who is liable for what when something happens? Um, unfortunately, people, and it, you know, it's not a product. So it cannot be measured. So, uh, you know, with, with a product, you can say it comes in, you know, uh, X, Y, Z parameters at this weight uh, at this time. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a person, that changes from you person to person. You can't charge per kilo for a person? <laughs> well, you can't charge for a kilo for a person just because of it. <clears throat>
<laughs> that's a different type of um, contract. <laughs> So yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I'm I'm jotting that one down so that I can actually use that moving forward. Um, so so uh, yeah, I think that liabilities and and contracts are becoming challenging because, um, as David mentioned, with big corporations, they will use contracts which are set in stone, and they're usually set for a a product as opposed to a service. Um, there are so many things that can affect your warehouse. And again, if we look back to COVID right now, we're seeing a lot of organisations that have uh, gone up by 30 and, and sometimes 50% in output. Um, so when you relate it to automation, uh, a lot of organisations believe, well, my, my automation solution should be able to um, provide me this sort of output. But when we put it under the strains of COVID and the amount of output that COVID has created in that solution, it actually has an effect on the mechanical aspects of automation, but also the people. So you may have only set out in that contract that you will need to service that piece of equipment maybe uh, half yearly, but because of the use of it, you now need to service it twice, uh, you know, three times, four times yearly. You may not have en enabled or allowed for that many people to be available to service that piece of equipment. Therefore, the equipment has now gone out or, or gone down um, and therefore throughput hasn't gone through it. So who's liable for that? Because yes, you have a set contract in place that you should be able to meet those parameters, but, but, but the circumstances around us has, has meant that you, you're not able to meet it. So um, it is a very, very tr tricky and challenging thing. Uh, luckily here in Australia, we do have um, a lot of employment law in place and IR that protects employees, uh, they are not liable, but businesses certainly are. So mm. um, I am finding that uh, from, from our side in particular in recruitment, we're needing to become a lot more savvy in the way in which we sign contracts with organisations to ensure that we're not liable at the end of the day. Yeah, okay, now that's a really good insight again. And, and, and again, it sounds like, you know, the, the, the people, once again, the most important part, hard to measure, hard to control, and circumstances can change everything, right? But let, let's, let's, while we're still, you know, just wrapping up this, this contracts and law um, discussion, I think I might drag Baz, David and, and Michael back into it. For me personally, when I'm looking at, uh, at, a, at a system, at a warehouse, I'm thinking functional operation, everything that we've done in the first eight sessions, you know, how, how does the operation need to operate to give the business outcome? And that stuff is measurable. How do I get that into a contract? Let's say, in, in terms of my, my um, I will start with you, Michael, but how do I make sure functionally I'm covered, you know, and, and what are those key milestones? You know, we've got practical acceptance, final acceptance. How, how do I make sure that I'm, I'm going in the right direction there? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there we're, we're talking about, you know, buying a system there, so procuring a system, because obviously there's different ways and that's kind of um, an important thing to get up from the beginning, so what, what's the commercial model first? Are we buying a system? Are we having it or as yep. a service or whatever? That's really going to determine the contract type and therefore how performance gets sold um, under the contract. Um, I mean, there's different different mechanisms. So you, you're talking about the acquisition of the system, so purchase of the system. Um, <clears throat> there's sometimes a bit of a, um, a mistake that people sort of fall into, which is that that's the legal part of the contract and then that's the commercial and the operational part of the contracts and it's we'll just whack on some annexures at the back and that's the the bit that we'll use and the lawyers will take care of that bit at the front and the, the two are kind of a separate work streams and i think that's a yes you know, it's a big mistake that the two depend on each other so the, the legal definitions will reach out to those operational schedules and annexures and kind of for meaning so some of this temptation just to staple something on the back and say, well, that's our acceptance test procedure, or that's our um, definition of practical completion, or that sort of thing. It's important that the lawyers kind of knows the significance of that. And depending on which lawyers are involved, you know, that they may or may not have that experience, and therefore you've got to take the front foot, make sure that they're across which parts are important, and the performance and what this means, and this is something that's a handover. So everybody understands what those milestones are, the steps, what the tests are, and, and everything else. Um, and then there's different ways of doing it. You know, there's lots of different performance. That's obviously the big um, litigation under the contract that the supplier is going to, to perform their obligations. Um, you don't want to be left out of pocket. You're paying all this money in installments. 
and at the end of it, you want the system to come online, online and um, on time and perform as they, they said. So there are different mechanisms. So sometimes money is held back or put into a, kind of a separate account or a, a guarantee or something like that. And mm -hmm. um, to ensure that you've got security for the contract and the system performs as it's meant to do and that you can tap into that money if it doesn't and, um, and get some it's some such a hard it's such a hard topic to skim isn't it because it's really all about the detail i know that i'm learning it's about the exact word that you use yeah you know, making sure that you're using principle yeah go first yeah absolutely well as you because you because you, you're right it's in the end it's you know we can have a great contract with all the legal i'll call it mumbo jumbo my apologies michael um <laughs> but if there's no if, if there's no if there's no link to what it needs to do operationally and on a daily basis it doesn't it never work so we see this all the time, depending on who you deal with with a partner. You know, we deal with all the major vendors here in Australia. They all have slightly different definitions of the same thing. And it's, it's, it'd be as simple as, you know, uh, what's, a, what's a factory acceptance test versus what's a site acceptance test? And, you know, what's a volume test versus a, a functional test? Or what's a day in the life of versus a practical completion? You know, I think one of the terminologies I think in AS4910 is you can have practical completion with a list of um, defects that does not affect the operation. Some or something along those lines. What's a defect that doesn't affect the operation? Is that a report that's not available? Or is it that, you know, that someone has to stand on a button all day long to press uh, a button to make sure that the, the cons flow through? Both instances, the system will still work. Um, it's just has different, different impacts. Those type of definitions are very hard to quantify if you don't get someone like yourselves involved up front when you start signing these contracts because they all have they're all, they're all interconnected yeah yes yeah. yeah it's really easy as well to if you're not familiar with the way that the contract mechanism works it's really easy to to sign the contract put it away and get on with it and forget that there's the contracts the standards it you know the stream standard has all these procedures and things that have to be done within seven days or 14 days. And you can get yourself into real trouble if you're not sort of asking those questions about what, who is the superintendent? What does that mean? Who, what is practical completion? What does that mean? What are the operational procedures that we have to put around that so we don't sort of stumble on the contract? All uh, yeah, I think with, uh, with, with legal contracts, it seems like hindsight's not such a wonderful thing. <laughs> you, know, you really don't want to be... <laughs> If you if you don't read through the contract up front, invariably you're going to end up becoming an expert in that contract down the line when she hits the fan, right? That's it. Yeah. So I, I think that's a great great point for us to um to kind of transition one. into. Oh, did someone want to say something? I just have another one um, on the uh, contracts. Uh, it's important to make sure, to review the limitation of liability clause, because often that's where they say, um, oh, you, you're just limited to the amount you paid us. Uh, and you've got to make sure that it's excluding everything you want it to exclude. So it's excluding privacy breaches, excluding cyber breaches, excluding a lot of things from that limitation of liability. Uh, you want to make sure that your SLA penalties are the same. They're not just, um, you know, nothing, you know, 50% or 10% of what you paid them. It's going to be something more substantial. You make sure the cyber insurance included in the contract. Um, and you make sure you've got a good definition of, of good practice in cyber security. You don't just say best practice because no one's going to agree to it. You have to have a really good definition of what you actually mean. That's by a good point too. Yeah. Of, best practice gets thrown about around. No, we the, use we use industry good practice and have a very good definition of it. Okay, no, that, that's very interesting as well. All right, um, we'll, we'll we'll move on. We'll come back to to all of these topics if, if we do get some time. But we're we we're, we're enjoying this conversation too much and time flying. So Alex, your time to shine. Um, I know you've already dabbled in all of this a little bit, but Overall, what are the key trends you're seeing? You know, are we getting more full-time employees, more part-time employees, a lot more lay, uh, casual labour, uh, specifically warehousing? And I know you go up kind of sea level. Are we seeing, you know, a different sea level position appearing as well? Um, are we seeing a different sea level? I, I think that uh, organisations are employing different levels and different role types. Uh, you know, you look at things like continuous improvement managers in organisations these days as a standard point, uh, rather than just a, a few organisations. But um, overall, you know, if I even look at warehousing from the perspective of the last 15 years that I've been involved with it, um, the last several years, it has shaped and shifted so fast um, 
you know, every warehouse is looking for its uniqueness. It's looking for its way to be more effective, more efficient, more, you know, uh, more cost effective, you know, whether that be through the implementation of voice pick, uh, different material handling equipment, um, automation solutions, you know, it, it's all coming so fast and, and realistically what that's yep. doing to skills, um, what they require out of employees, it is changing rapidly. Um, you know, the warehouse and distribution industry is one of the fastest growing industries in Australia. And, and I think if you just look at um, real estate, you know, just recently, uh, industrial real estate became a better commodity than commercial real estate for the first time in Australia's history. And that just really shows the emphasis on industrial space right now. Um, unfortunately, there is less people looking to move into the sector uh, than there has been in years prior. So, um, you know, what that means is at an operational level, at, at, at the floor, pickers, packers, forklift drivers, uh, less and less people are obviously leaving school and saying, hey, that's a career for me. Um, there are more and more people studying in the field. Absolutely. But if we really think about the next five to 10 years, will we have to look at an operations manager as needing to know uh, computer programming? Will that be a standard skill set for an operational person? Um, data analysis, I don't definitely, have a crystal. right? <laughs> data analysis. Yeah, data analysis. I think you're hitting, you're hitting the nail yeah. on the head because we started this, this journey of talking about the ugly duckling. And, and to be honest, when I was at uni, I didn't want to drive into the, the, go into the warehousing industry either because it was, it's warehousing. And for so long, really? the warehouse has been the ugly duckling of the organization. And that's, that's what we started the series of saying, hey, but now it's the swan. It's, it's the... It's the knight in shining armor. It saves your organization when all your stores are closed and your clients still want your stuff. The warehouse has come to the forefront. And that's what I was alluding to as well. With the change of these C-level positions, we're seeing supply chain officers. We're seeing direct reports to the top of the chain through, through supply chain and specifically through distribution. Well, I, I, I think, think Alex, as well. Do you, mm. Sorry. Do you see a disconnect happening now as well? As you say, you know, our industry is evolving rapidly. I mean, to the point where, you know, Jeff and I stay on top of what happens, but even for us, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to keep up to date with everything that, get, that, that, gets, that gets thrown our way, from technology to, um, to, 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 to data, to cybersecurity, to, to legal, to everything. It's constantly changing. Um, education inherently is not really used to change and not really prone to change. So do you see a disconnect happening in the next five to 10 years of, you know, pe people leaving school with the wrong skills for what we're looking for? <laughs> I've done a lot of work with this. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, because there's no, if you ask the average, you know, let's say it's 15 to 18 year old, why they're able to walk into Coles and, and pick up an item guaranteed any time they are there. In fact, it's almost distressing to most people of a young age today as to why they can't receive something when they want it. But they don't understand the mechanisms behind them being able to receive that product. And that's not emphasized in schools at all. Um, you know, I have a lot of passion for the, the supply chain industry because I find it such a fascinating aspect because I've been able to see it. Um, but unfortunately, there are not many school institutes and there aren't many employers out there that are actually opening up their doors to people to allow them through their facilities to see what it all looks like. Um, you know, if we were to revert this back onto automation, um, I think that there's going to need to be a lot more work placed into the younger demographics and uh, younger school leavers around what is automation and robotics, because that is going to be the industry that is advancing rapidly in the 10 years to come. And if we do not train and we do not um, excite these people about what the possibilities are and the potential role types in those fields, Unfortunately, we are going to have a declining market because as we see it right now, there is less than, uh, there's, there's good, yeah, good, good studies that show there's less than 10,000 people around Australia employed in automation right now today. And in the five to 10 years that come to fruition, 
uh, it's likely that those numbers are now nearly going to need to be tenfold to keep up with the builds and the service contracts that are coming into play for those uh, automated facilities. So these people have got to come from somewhere. And, and unfortunately, right now, we're not doing enough to train them and, and getting kids enthused about this in, uh, workplace or, or this type of environment. One of the, that's one of the key driving reasons for us uh, doing this series, to be honest, where we're also finding it hard to find warehouse engineers, as I call it, from our point of view, people that want to design these things. Um, I might just move on to Michael just to, to, to keep the conversation going around. Um, you mentioned uh, labor hire contracts, a big part of what you're doing uh, these days as well, or a part of what you do. I think the big part was more the, the anti-competitive stuff, which is quite interesting, but might have to be for another topic. Um, any tips on what to look out for when you are, when, when Alex is putting a contract in front of you? Yes, so, yeah. well, hopefully Alex, it will already be perfect by the time, but, um, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, you know, a, a labor hire agreement is effectively the labor hire company providing a service to the business. It's, it's a lot like any other service agreement um, in terms of the service levels and fees, you know, what are you getting and how much are you paying for it? That's the, the, the key to the, um, to many service agreements. Um, and then the specifics around, you know, the issues we've talked about before uh, on this um, discussion. So uh, WHS, health and safety requirements, um, specifically insurance, um, understanding together. So if you're a host employer, so you're the business that's using a labor hire company whose insurance is going to work, um, working through the insurance broker, um, and then a kind of a specific one is around, you know, particularly as you get into kind of more senior um, hires coming in through sort of labor hire arrangements, the kind of non-poach, non-solicits, we've got a good person here, um, can we steal that person away from our organization? You talk then about the, the shortage of skilled people, so making sure that you hang on to the people that you've got, um, and you've got them, so yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, now, uh, just uh, again, I'll drag Dave back in uh, just to have a, a look at specifically. And, and before, actually, there was a question about data, um, data analysis tools. And, and to be honest, um, in, in Tiaz, thanks for asking again. There's heaps out there. Um, you know, you, you just it's about um, using Excel access, database management tools. Well, our data scientist use, uh, does everything in Python. So yeah, if you, if you want to reach out and find out a little bit more about that, we're more than happy to. It's definitely a skill for the future supply chain, anyone. You know, if you want to be adding value to your distribution organization, supply chain organization, if you can do data analysis, then you, you're, 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 you're some of the way there. Uh, Dave, just going back to the question for you, how do you make sure you hire the right people in, in cybersecurity? So I think the key um, control has already been mentioned, which was the, the background check. Um, so that's a criminal check, a reference check, as well as an employment history check. Um, they're worth it. They cost a few hundred dollars an employee, but they're definitely worth it. Um, so, and across your third parties, it's one of the controls you go and check against your, uh, in your third party assessment to make sure they're doing it, even, and they're doing it in all their locations offshore. If they're in India or Philippines or whatever, they're doing the, the same background checks in all those jurisdictions. Uh, putting the cyber... just, just out of curiosity, David, yeah. would you would you say that that's something that you need to actually bring internal, or or is it make sense that you know something so specialised like cybersecurity, uh, you can go to an expert like yourself, and, and that's enough for your organisation. Uh, you every organisation. Yeah, um, you need to have someone internally to own it. Um, you, you need to have, and it has to be a senior person you know, uh, in in the technology organisation uh, that has that focus. Um, I, you know, most organisations we deal with, um, you know, you can't get to a certain level unless you have someone there on, on boots on the ground who's you know, overseeing those actual operational IT controls because IT left to themselves won't probably do it. Okay. Now, um, I, I, I did just want to, we're going to have to start wrapping up. I'm sure Daniel's going to give me a, 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 um, a bit of a nudge soon. I, I wanted to throw one last one out there because... It, it, I, I'm seeing it and I'm guessing, you know, the, the guys that are seeing the warehousing and, and um, distribution space directly are seeing it as well. It, this move towards a casual labor force, you know, people want to have the minimum amount of fixed heads on and be able to scale up and down. Is this the risk? Is this a, is this, is this a risk 
or an opportunity for an organization? Maybe a, a, a one minute spill from each on, on what you guys think. And, and Dave, you can start from a, from a cybersecurity point of view, more casual people in your organization, risk or opportunity? Um, I think it's opportunity because you, you, you um, I think we're moving, moving to a gig economy anyway. I think, you know, you, you're seeing a, a, a um, more task-based work. Uh, we're all task-based at the moment. I think most of the you know, engagements you get in cyber would be task-based because, you know, there's just not that many resources around. There's a, and that's how you deal with the shortage of resources. You're just going to have to, you know, tap the market for someone to do a particular task. And, and mm. And you may have sort of someone, the, people, the permanent people who understand and can make decision making, decision making and management and, and governance and risk and oversight internally. Um, you go to, you have a mixture of, um, you know, permanent people who do that sort of stuff, contingent labour for projects that you need to execute and consulting firms for advice. And most organisations now have the mix of the three. Mm, okay. Michael, any thoughts? Yeah, so, I mean, from a, you know, a lawyer, a legal market is, it's the same, so that the market's moving towards that. So, you know, the tradition of a law firm with lots of lawyers that do everything, moving more towards kind of gig economy style. Um, lawyers will join the project at the right time, the right specialist for the project. And, um, you know, I think something that highlights to me, we've been talking about all these different specialisms, um, you know, data security, legal, um, employment markets, data analysis, all these different, everything's becoming more and more specialists. So when you're dropping in and out of projects, it's that, that kind of macro skill of being able to work with professionals from other specialisms, understand their perspective, helping them understand what you do and what you bring to it so that they can take that into account for their work and then find out what their work is or how does that affect what you're doing and being able yeah. to work with a mixed team on a project to get the results at the end. So that's a, kind of a macro skill that's coming through and it's, it's going to be really important for the future. So it's, it's just the reality of the future and make the most of it. Basically, yeah, exactly. right? The, yeah. the collaboration is a huge opportunity when you're involved in it. Yeah. Alex, fun part. oh, sorry, go. Oh, it's, it's the fun, fun part. part. Fun part, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we've all met in, in, in that one way or another. Uh, Alex, any thoughts? Uh, well, of course, coming from uh, a recruitment firm, yes, of course, I would say casualization is a very positive <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> however, to that point, there is an analogy within uh, operational standpoints where they want to be able to turn on and turn off the labor. Um, now, the benefits of utilizing a casual workforce is potentially, particularly for this gig economy and for this part service, you may have someone that is well and truly overqualified doing a task or a job that, you know, may not need that level of skill set. So you potentially may open up the opportunity for. Uh, further learnings, opportunities for other people in permanent employment to learn and, and other things like that. Um, you know, to, to that point, though, I think about onboarding and I think about, uh, you know, why would someone come back to your organisation? Because we shouldn't always think about the problem here and now. We should think about next year's problem, which is going to occur again. Uh, we know that in warehouse and distribution, October, November, December, January is going to be our peak seasons. So, yeah, we're, we're in October. We need to think about how, what is the quickest and most efficient way to onboard those people and embed them into our organisation so that they can be productive as quickly as possible. But then also think about what impression are we leaving on these people so that they want to come work for us again. Um, and that's something that I don't think a lot of organisations are really considering. They see the problem here and now quick resolve, I need these skills here and now, and then I want them gone tomorrow. Um, where it should be, yes, I want them gone tomorrow, but I want to potentially, if that person's available next year, have them back in here so that they can be productive again faster next year. Hopefully I wasn't on mute for that entire spiel. <laughs> yeah, you're on mute. No, not at all, man. I think Dan's going to wrap it up. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, no, thankfully, no, not on me there, Alex. That was a, a great wrap up to the, to the session. And I have to say that really was a, a really uh, fascinating and great in-depth discussion, guys. I, I really did enjoy that. And it's a really nice way to round off the nine uh, different webinars we've done so far. So a massive thank you to, uh, to Michael, Alex and David for joining us today. Um, but an, an absolutely massive thank you as well to, to Buzz and Jeff for, uh, for the uh, huge amount of work they've put in over these nine sessions and uh, the great insights that we've had uh, during this webinar. Um, 
process and, and also it will be able to people will be able to go back and, and look at those and, and look into the details and understand it not only from a, uh, a future proofing perspective but also from an educational perspective as well so thank you all to everyone who's joined us uh, for these nine sessions and joined us today um, please do uh, keep up to date with any future webinars that we do hold uh, please uh, if you are in Australia uh, please do try and attend a CMAT which is now in uh, February of next year, the 16th to the 18th, um, where we will be continuing these discussions and have some familiar faces from this webinar. And hopefully uh, Michael, Alex and David can also join us as well. Uh, so thank you so much. Take care. Have a great evening and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care.